So this last topic is immunological disorder. So basically when things go, go wrong. And there are three major components to this topic. Um, so we're going to look at hypersensitivities today. I'm really hoping to get through all four of them. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, and then, uh, so hypersensitivity, hyper means too much, right? We're oversensitive to whatever it is that's causing the immunological response. Like an allergy, right? So autoimmune, auto meaning self, in this case, we're attacking self. Our immune system is attacking ourselves. So something has gone wrong, right, with the communication of the system, and we're attacking ourselves. Immunodeficiency, this is where the immune fish system has become deficient. And there are two main ways in which it can be deficient. You can acquire it, and most of us are aware of HIV, so we'll talk a little bit about HIV. Um, and um, you can genetically be defective, right? You can be born, right, with a defect in, in the parts of your immune system. And there's different types of defects that we'll talk about um, as related to immunodeficiency. So um, the first hypersensitivity we're going to talk about, and there are four of them, that, uh, they're numbered, but I, I, I don't want you guys memorizing numbers. Um, we'll, we'll stick with the whole title, right? So type 1 hypersensitivity is immediate IgE mediated. And this gives you a lot of information right there in the title about what's going on. So. It is an immunological response, right? It deals with a particular class of antibody we haven't talked too much about, just a little bit, and that is IgE. As the name implies, immediate, right? This happens pretty much right away. And there are four different manifestations that fall under this classification. So we're gonna look at four different examples of this type of hypersensitivity. But um, to start, I'm going to go ahead and play the animation for this one. Yeah, I'm recording. What? Oh. Let's try this again. I was wondering where you were going, but it's like, I don't see nothing. Y'all need to say something. Okay. <laughs> That's why I did. <laughs> okay. Earlier. Something's That's wrong. okay. You didn't miss much. There wasn't much on the slide except for those. <laughs> Sensitization occurs when the antigen makes Whoa, contact. that's really loud. Okay. <laughs> Some people. Okay, okay. I promise I'm going to put it down. Okay. Try that again. <laughs> Hurry. Some people develop an allergic reaction or a hypersensitivity when exposed to substances such as dust, pollens, animal dander, or penicillin. This hypersensitivity is mediated by IgE. Sensitization occurs when the antigen makes contact with some part of the body. The antigen is taken up, processed by antigen-presenting cells, and presented on a class 2 MHC to T helper cells. Tissues under the mucous membranes are rich in B cells committed to IgE production, and IgE producing cells are more abundant in persons susceptible to allergies. The T helper cells produce cytokines, which stimulate these B cells to proliferate and differentiate into IgE producing plasma cells. As IgE is produced in specific areas of the body, the IgE molecules attach via their constant regions to receptors on nearby mast cells. Mast cells contain granules packed with chemicals that induce a hypersensitivity response. Once attached, the IgE molecules can survive for many weeks. The individual is now sensitized to the antigen. When exposed to the antigen for a second time, the antigen binds to the IgE antibodies on the mast cells. To trigger a response, two cell-bound IgE molecules must react with a specific antigen. 
Within seconds of the reaction, the mast cell releases histamine and other mediators of the inflammatory response from the granules, triggering a variety of symptoms. So, seem familiar? It's our normal immunological response to producing antibodies, right? What's the bad thing about this one? Is pollen going to hurt you? No, right? It's not going to grow in your body. It's not going to destroy you, right? It's, it's a non-harmful substance, right? But we are making an immunological response to it. What class of antibody are we producing? IgE. What's the difference, right? This is one action we haven't looked at when we looked at about antibody actions. This is not opsonizing for destruction, right? This is not clumping them together to be eliminated, right? It's not eliciting natural killer cells because it's not cells, right? It's not activating complement, right? Instead, it's attaching to mast cells or basophils, right? By that FC portion, though, right so that the second exposure so the first time right you're going through what we call the primary response you're generating these antibodies these IgEs it's touching my face <laughs> um, and then they're going to attach to these cells and as it said it, th those antibodies will stay there for weeks at a time so the next time you inhale it they're already attached to these effector cells. So that's why you get that immediate reaction. And so you get things like capillary dilation that's related to inflammation, right? If it's happening in the airways, you get constriction, right? We, your body's like, oh, bad stuff, don't let it in. Well, the problem is when you constrict airways, you also constrict your ability to breathe, which you kind of need to live, right? So that one seems kind of strange, right? It's like, oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> constrict, but not too much. Um, mucus secretion, why would that be helpful? Yeah, we want to trap it, right, and, and keep it from getting in to begin with, right? So that one, you know, is good, but that overproduction, right, in this case to something that isn't necessarily going to hurt us gets to be irritating. Um, pain, again, because of um, inflammation and the swelling that may happen in particular areas where this is happening. And then also some of the mediators that are released by these cells um, cause that itching response, right, as we all start scratching. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I started getting like I couldn't breathe. Right. Like, my airways get constricted again. Mm -hmm. So would that would that be an uh, additional? Um, uh, it was listed. No, it's listed. listed. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, you're spacing out on me. Can we go back just to show you? Yeah. <laughs> airway constriction number two. Because okay. <laughs> I was thinking of airway constriction like when you're like. Yeah, well, that's why is you feel like you can't breathe. Oh, you mean like my, your throat, throat swells? Oh, your throat swells. Okay, so again, and that's swell, where where you have inflammation in the throat region, um, and uh, and that's blocking um, your ability to breathe, um, where the throat is swelling, um, not necessarily where you're having airway constriction, right, of leading to your lungs, right? Your okay. throat, of course, portion of your throat, right, leads to your larynx and your mm -hmm. yeah, trachea, yeah. which allows you to breathe. It wasn't listed on there, but I've noticed since I've gotten older, certain foods I have some type of allergy, like an allergic response to, because if I don't eat it, I'll get really congested, like I have to spit it out, you know. Yeah. And I'll get really congested, like from peanut butter, mayonnaise, ketchup, different things. Like yeah, that. yeah, and it, it, yeah, it's probably might be some milk type of allergy. Number one is for everybody. People don't realize that you drink milk, you create more mucus. Which yeah. is something I know that's what's happening over here now. Peanut butter, I couldn't condense like I'm really, I like peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it could be that you're, you know, when you eat, you inhale a little bit of your food. And so that might be why you would have congestion as opposed to this, the worst case scenario where you could have widespread, um, which we're going to talk about so in a moment. So you speak of airway constriction, mm -hmm. it's more like the asthmatic It's what we refer to as asthma. Yeah. 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 Whereas the throat swelling in an anaphylaxis type situation is just from the inflammation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
So as we said, IgE causes this immediate reaction, but this is after you've been sensitized, right? After you've already, that for, first exposure that unfortunately you went down the IgE route and you produce the IgEs, right? So characterized by immediate reaction, but the important point is that there's a period where you become sensitized and you don't know it, right? And then you have that reaction the, the second time. Um, and literally within minutes or seconds this can happen, but it can be a little bit more prolonged, a half an hour or so for some people, depending on what you're exposed to. The tendency to have type 1 hypersensitivity is inherited, and we generally refer to these nowadays generally as al allergies, right, as an allergic reaction, um, which is why they're also sometimes referred to as allergens. Um, so. And, and this number is probably increasing, again, due to the fact that it's inherited. And, and especially with some particular allergies um, that can be widespread, so localized, right, where you have that happening in your, in your nose and such is generally referred to as hay fever, right? Um, because, it, you know, hay, the things um, in, in dried grasses, those pollens, right, are very commonly causes of nasal congestion, so that's where it gets that name. Um, people who ingest stuff, though, unfortunately, that's localized. Hay fever is a localized reaction. Even asthma, where you have the airway constriction, right, where you've inhaled a an allergen, it's affecting your lungs, is considered a localized. When you ingest something, when you eat a food substance, right, it can go into your bloodstream, so you can have a systemic response, right? Um, and so this is true for foods, but as well as medications or some people, there's a lot of people who have, have developed penicillin allergy, right? And this is referred to as um, generalized, right, or systemic. And this one can be quite life-threatening, right? It's also referred to as anaphylaxis, <coughs> right? Um, So, uh, especially with peanut allergies, um, that could be life-threatening. You see more and more people with it, it seems like all we talk about now in schools and such as that, right, is um, peanut allergy. And the main reason for this, think about this, if you were a kid, right, and you were allergic to peanut butter, before we knew about a lot of these things, what probably happened to you when you ate that peanut butter and jelly sandwich? you went into anaphylactic shock and you died, right? You didn't grow up and have children, right? Nowadays, right, we can detect these things. We have much more, um, much more access to medical care, right? We have more knowledge of the situation. So hopefully if they don't have a very severe reaction the first time, right, they're able to get medical treatment and they're able to avoid that from now on, right? They grow up, guess what? They get married, they have kids. The kids inherit what? peanut allergies, right? So for me, I have allergies. My mom has allergies. My son has allergies, right? We inherited them from each other, this tendency to go towards the IgE. The good news for us is it's, you know, hay fever allergy. You know, it's not peanut butter allergy, right? Um, so, but same progression for these things, right? You've gotta have that sensitization. We've seen that interaction, right? You gotta have the helper T cells that help that B cell, and unfortunately those B cells in, in particular areas of our body tend to go the IgE route, right? And that's the bad news here, is that it's generating the IgEs which attach to the mast cells, right? And can stay there for long periods of time. So upon the second exposure, it immediately reacts and releases its mediators. The one that we're most familiar with is histamine, right? Most people who experience allergy, right, we're trying to combat this release of histamine, right? Um, it's one of the major mediators, especially for a nasal type allergy, not so much with asthma, which is why people who have asthma don't really take antihistamines. They're taking other types of drugs <coughs> that are gonna deal with the mediators released by the cells in that area. Okay, so a little bit different type reaction there. Um, remember, it's a helper T cell, and, and even the video, they did a good job of the MHC class two presented, right? But what's that co-receptor that the helper T cells have that allow them to communicate with MHC class two? CD4, CD4. yay. You guys are not gonna miss that on the test. So, um, 
Some examples of hypersensitivities, hives it refers to that reaction in the skin. And what this actually is a picture of is a, a skin test. And the reason for that, I know that is other than probably the, the figure description, mm -hmm. but the lines drawn here, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're keeping track of what they put where on the person's skin. So you can see the flare in the wheel, the puffiness, but this is just inflammation, right, of the skin. But you really get the, that, that, the puffiness. I don't know what, they're moving furniture upstairs, I guess. <laughs> Sound like I know, it makes me, but I know it's not supposed to rain today, so it's not thunder. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It could be, but I think it's furniture. Okay, right, so they've literally scratch or inject into the skin, and I know I've had this done. Um, it's pretty um, not cool experience <laughs> if anyone it have to who's be done that way but yeah it doesn't have to be done that way anymore uh, but when they when I was first d determining my allergies and, and sometimes they still need to do this type of test um, so they'll like I said they'll they'll do it on your forearm is actually what you see here um, and they did it on both my forearms they'll even do it on your back um, sometimes on your thighs um, uh, so one of the alternatives that they'll do now is that they can take a blood sample and in, in your blood you have these IgEs sometimes too, right? And so they can detect the level into what specific um, allergens, right? And so they're usually looking for particular allergens. So in my case, you know, I'd had testing done a long time ago and I went through a desensitization process that we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, and so when I went back to the allergist, I, I was like, you know, uh, I wasn't able to finish my desensitization. I've been really suffering. If need be, I'll go through the whole process again. And he's like, oh, no, we don't need to do the scratch test again. But, you know, we'll look at your results from before and see where your levels are at for the certain things that you were allergic to. Um, and so I, I was very happy about that. And then there's new, there's new um, treatments out there um, that I'm waiting for <laughs> um, that are in the final rounds of FDA approval. I'm surprised my doctor hasn't called me yet. I'm, I'm like, what's the holdup? Um, of where you can take a pill, right, for desensitization now. Um, where you where you take orally um, the the different po grass pollens, um, or they're developing a pill form for that. Um, one of the the quick easy ways that you can do that and help with desensitization is local honey. Um, local honey contains the local <coughs> pollens in it, and if you're exposing yourself orally, this is different than inhaling it, and so your body tends to go to a different class of antibodies. Anyone to know which one you'll tend to produce? You'll produce A, right? That'll help you with through your mucus. But IgG, too, will be really protective if it gets inside of your body. Um, where those antibodies get to it first, hopefully, before your IgEs. And because you're not continually stimulating that process of IgEs, right, you'll lessen the amount that you're producing, right? So. The sensitization that, that I went through, and I'm jumping ahead, but that's okay. Here. All right, so the hope is that the IgGs get to it first, where they would actually inject, right? So they found out exactly what I was allergic to, made a special cocktail just for me, um, and they would inject it into my skin. So again, hopefully that I would go the IgG route, right, instead of producing IgEs. And, and the good news with that is that when I had that skin test done, and, and at that time I wanted to be a veterinarian, I had all these animals, and I'm looking at the arm, they put, did all the pet danders on, and I'm like, I'm just going to cut you off if you puff up, right? I cannot be allergic to animals. Instead, the other arm that was all the pollens, like thistle and ragweed and <coughs> was just, I mean, it was so bad I couldn't wear my watch after the skin testing. Um, it swelled so bad I had to take steroids after my skin testing to thistle. The good news is, is that um, I, I don't think I'm allergic to thistle anymore. Um, the, through going through the desensitization, um, that one I'm not allergic to anymore. Ragweed, on the other hand, not the case. Yeah, ragweed's one of those high I, Yeah, yeah. It's one of those ones that it just isn't going to happen um, 
for me, unfortunately. We're not going to talk about this one. I meant to take it out. It's a, it's a, an interesting high tech um, therapy that I'm not too sure if it's actually being used anymore. So I wanted to do some research into it before <coughs> discussing it. So you don't have to worry about that slide. So this skin reaction is also commonly referred to as hives, right? And so if you get, if your skin comes in contact, of course, with the skin testing, they're purposely doing this to you. Um, if, if you ingest something, though, your food, think about it, feeds your entire body. So, so sometimes, too, you'll get a skin reaction when you ingest something. You'll get hives when you ingest something. And for people, when it tends to be a food allergy, you tend to get in the abdominal region first, right? The skin associated with your abdominal region, because that, of course, gets the blood supply first from what you ate, right? Um, but it can, you know, spread um, quite significantly for individuals that have food allergies. So not just contact, right? But you, you can get a rash sometimes if those allergens are spread to your skin, right, if you ingest them. Um, sometimes it's not necessarily a rash, though, because, I mean, you can get inflammation in the, in the intestinal area. It creates, like, the giant uncomfortable bloat, which right. is really a food sensitivity, but yeah. people just think they ate too much. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you can get inflammation in your intestines themselves, right, and feel bloated and uncomfortable and think you ate too much, but in truth you're having an allergic reaction. Um, hay fever, as I said, typically is something you've inhaled, right? So it typically in affects your nose um, and even some people for their eyes, right, because your eyes are exposed, right, to these um, allergens in the air. So you end up with the itchy eyes, the sneezing, the runny nose. Again, this is an inflammatory response due to the mediators released from those mast cells, right, once they bind to the IgEs you've already produced. And I, I can attest to that it can literally happen within seconds, right? You can inhale something that you're allergic to and within seconds be stuffed up. My son, three pages of allergies I talked to you about that before. When he was little, he was in, um, kindergarten and the white oaks had gone into pollen so uh -huh. it was all over the playground material uh -huh. and they called me from the school apparently he got in his hand and he rubbed his eye and the white the sclera of his eye had swollen whoa it was the weirdest coolest weirdest <coughs> uncomfortable disturbing still cool looking thing i'd ever seen in my life and the poor, poor teachers were freaked <laughs> i would think so i would think so um, but yeah, so I mean, it can be pretty extreme, especially if you have a large exposure, right, um, to these things. And, and, and you know, I, like I said, I can attest to some really uncomfortable. The good news is that for the most part, right, <laughs> you're not going to die from something like this. Asthma, on the other hand, when you are inhaling down into the lungs, right, and you get that airway constriction, it can be quite life threatening. Um, and quite frightening um, for those individuals. And as I said, it's a little bit different mediators than it is for hay fever, which is um, because of the, the cells doing different things in that area, which makes sense. You wouldn't necessarily want the inflammation so much that you have in your nose and stuff like that in your airways, but you still get those pretty bad effects of the inflammation. Now, generalized, although rare and more serious, although not as rare as it used to be, right? Um, and this is where it enters into the bloodstream. So most of us are aware of, of food allergies have the potential for this type of thing. Um, but also some things that are injected, like drugs, right? Um, and venoms. So um, venoms from uh, wasps, bees. Um, not so much snakes, that's a whole nother issue with their venom. Their venom spiders. specifically causes problems. But spiders, um, some people are allergic to, to the lovely um, venom. It's actually venom. Um, they actually bang you with a stinger for the um, fire ants here, right? Oh, yeah. They'll bite you, but that's only to grab on, to turn around and, and stab you with their stinger. Most people um, are sensitive to the formic acid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but there are some people that actually are allergic, will have an allergic reaction. And the bad news is, is that the, well, I guess the good news with the ants is that they're so much smaller that typically their venom hopefully doesn't enter into the bloodstream directly. Um, but um, bees and wasps and stuff like that, there's the danger of a really deep penetration where it gets into the bloodstream, um, directly into the bloodstream, um, where it can be severely life-threatening for those individuals. So they carry around an EpiPen, 
which is just epinephrine. Um, and this is to create the constriction of the blood vessels, um, keep the heart rate going, so that you don't get that massive um, drop in blood pressure due to the, the inflammation, the dilation of the blood vessels that happens in the allergic response, right? In, in a normal immunological response, right? Again, unfortunately, this is an immunological response, but it's to something that is, shouldn't necessarily harm you, right? But your body thinks that it's um, big time bad. Um, so that extreme drop in the blood pressure is what they're trying to prevent with the epinephrine. And they don't just shoot themselves with epinephrine and go on about their day. They're going to the hospital, right, to get additional treatment um, for this. So we already talked about um, desensitization, immunotherapy. We're not going to talk about this particular immunotherapy. And so then that brings us to the next one which is um, type 2, which is referred to as cytotoxic. So again, in the name, cyto refers to cells, toxic. And this really only came about until we started doing um, blood transfusions, but also we saw it with hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, and this is related to a particular antigen that we have present on our red blood cells um, that you could make antibodies against. So this one is another antibody mediated one. So it's another one where again, you've got to be sensitized first, right? Uh, but not 100% true, I don't know how to say it, for, for blood transfusions. So um, with the ABO blood group, uh, you're exposed to antigens out there, bacteria or whatnot that have similar antigens to our AB antigens associated with the ABO blood group, right? If you have A-type blood, you have the A antigen. If you're B-type blood, you have B. If you're AB, you have both. If you're O, it actually means none. You don't have A or B. That's just one group of antigens, right, that's present on our red blood cells and one of the major ones that can cause problems with blood transfusions. <coughs> RH is a totally separate antigen, right? Um, in the case of the ABO, the A's and the B's, like I said, there are bacteria, there are pathogens out there that we're naturally exposed to um, that have these, the antigens very similar to A and B. And so you naturally get exposed to these, you naturally produce antibodies against them. But the class of antibody you produce is IgM. And what do we know about IgM? Can it cross the placenta? No, it's too large. It does not cross the placenta. IgG does, and that's where we run into the problem with the other antigen group, which is Rh. Is that one, you have to be exposed to actually the Rh antigen to produce those antibodies. In that case, though, it's IgGs you make, which can cross the placenta, and that's why it can create problems, right? So for... ABO blood group, we don't have to worry about moms and babies, but you still have to worry about blood transfusion of the wrong type because you naturally already have antibodies against the ones you don't have, right? So again, remember, you're not going to make antibodies against yourself unless you're experiencing autoimmune. So if you are like me, I'm O type blood, I've naturally been exposed to antigens that are like A and like B. So I already have IgMs against A and B in my system. So if you were to give me A type blood or B type blood or God forbid A and B, I'm going to have a reaction because those antibodies are going to attack. And remember, what can antibodies do? Well, these two classes of antibodies, both IgM and IgG, remember, can, can activate complement by the classical pathway. And so you have a cell, right? is being co coded in IgM or IgG, depending on what antigen we're talking about. Complement binds, it fixes it, right? C3B is not going to do us any good because it's, it's a human cell, right? We have the ability to regulate and stop C3B from binding, right? But what do we produce also when complement is activated other than C3B? C5A and C3A, so we get inflammation, right? So we get phagocytic cells heading to the area. What else can we form? MAC, MAC complex, which stands for membrane attack complex, 
Can that insert into the membranes of those red blood cells? Yeah. Yes, indeed, and can destroy those cells. Mm -hmm. Huh? <laughs> MAC attack, yeah, MAC attack. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so the other is, and, and remember, so antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, okay? This is another way they can be eliminated, but this is only one class of antibody. Which one does antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity? Ig. Well, what's the lymphocyte that's going to come around and grab onto it and actually kill the cells? The natural killer cells, right? But what class of antibody does he grab onto? We only talked about two classes, IgG. so it's IgG, right? So this doesn't happen, right, against the ABO blood group, right? But if you have IgGs like you do with RH, right, the natural killer cells can kill the cells coated in antibodies as well. So we have twofold ways in which they're commonly going to be destroyed because, again, it's attaching to a cell. So the two examples of um, hypersensitivities are transfusion reactions and hemolytic disease of the newborn. So as I said, with the ABO blood group, right, we, we, we need to make sure that those are properly matched. But notice that there are other antigens out there, right, that they'll test for and cross-match for. These are just the major ones that most people are aware of. The good news with this particular class, as I said, it's just IgM. Right? But you're going to get destruction of the red blood cells, and why did they give them to you in the first place? Because you don't have enough. Because you don't have enough, right? They're giving it to you for a reason, because you need them, right? And um, so having them destroyed, you have the problem of that, and then whatever reason it was that they gave you the blood to begin with. But you can have a severe drop in blood pressure, pain, nausea, vomiting, right? Because we're having this um, severe reaction and destruction of lots of red blood cells throughout the system. I remember in nursing school when we were talking about that, that was one of the ones where you're there literally on top of the person checking every few minutes their, mm -hmm. all their vitals and everything else. I mean, literally like every five minutes, then every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. but you just yeah, because be there to catch it if it happens. Right, yeah. So, it, I mean, it could, it, it could take about a half an hour, as long as a half an hour to happen. Sometimes it'll be immediate. You know, it just depends. Um, so these antigens, right, on the surface of our red blood cells, um, you're genetically inherited, right? So you, you, you'll see these trends in, in different um, ethnic groups, right, because of the inheritance, right, because you inherit. So at one time, blood typing was even kind of used a little bit for paternity. Um, it is not a 100% though, right, because um, if you are uh, a type blood, but you're heterozygous, which means you also have um, a gene that doesn't have the information. And, and if you were in A and heterozygous for A, you could end up with all the four different possibilities of children if those two parents were like that. But, you know, in certain instances, like I'm O, right, and my ex-husband is B, there's no way that my son is A, right, unless somebody's not telling the truth <laughs> or in trouble, right? Okay? Out, yeah, yeah. So, you know, right, the A would have had to come from somewhere, right? And in this case, neither one of us have A because neither one of us have the A blood type, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's one way, but like I said, some of the combinations you could have all the possibilities, right? So you can't necessarily rule it out that way. Um, but that's that's for genetic class or AMP class, having fun with Punnett squares. Uh, but yeah, or a Jerry Springer episode for sure. Um, so then the next that that can be a problem, and of course just for women, because as far as we know right now, right, we're the only ones that can do this, uh, and none of the guys are signing up for it. Um, so. The only women who have this problem are ones that are Rh negative. And the reason for this is Rh negative means you do not have that antigen on your red blood cells. So would you make the antibody if you're exposed? Yes, yes. right? Where if you're Rh positive like myself, I'm never going to make that antibody unless I'm, making, unless I'm experiencing autoimmune disease, right? I should never make the Rh antigen. I have it on my red blood cells. 
right? So how do you get exposed to positive blood? And with this one, you really got to be exposed to this specific antigen, right? Um, it isn't found in the environment on bacteria or anything like that, thank goodness. Isn't it usually during childbirth? Right. So there are several ways you can be exposed. One is someone gives you a blood transfusion of the wrong type blood, right? If you're negative, they give you positive, they screw up, you've been exposed, right? Um, and again, you might have this reaction down the line, <laughs> right? Days later, even in this case, because you weren't exposed previously, but now you've been exposed, right? You make antibodies, right? You may still have those red blood cells around. And so then you're, you're having this delayed type um, transfusion reaction going on. Um, so if you've got a blood transfusion of positive blood, it's one way you'd be exposed. Another way is if you are pregnant with a positive baby, and this is because, again, you could get the positive gene from the dad, right? Even though you're a negative, you didn't give them it, they could get it from their dad, right? So they could be positive. Um, there's a pretty good barrier between the placenta and, and the uterus where your blood is not mixed with your baby's blood, right? Unless there's damage to that placenta, right? So if there's trauma during pregnancy, right, where it could be, um, where that blood could mix, right? Then you're exposed to the baby's positive blood. You make antibodies against it. Have a C-section. Right. Um, no, well, C-section isn't necessarily gonna prevent that either. Because what happens when you give birth to a child, right? The child comes out first, and then the second birth is the placenta. When it detaches, there is the possibility of the mixing of the blood. The good news for the first baby, they usually leave first, right? They leave first. Right? Mixing the blood happens after. But if you have a miscarriage, depending on what level of a miscarriage, right, that's still, even though it's not a live birth, it's still, you have a placenta, you had a baby, you may have a pot of a baby, you could have mixing of that blood, right? So anytime baby's blood mixes with mommy's blood, right? So it could be trauma during pregnancy, it could be a miscarriage, right? Or it could be um, giving birth itself. What about induced abortion? Um, same thing. It would, it yeah, still? it just depends on what level, if the baby has red blood cells and how many, and, and the mixing could happen, right? If 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 the abortion is caught, if an abortion is caused, you know. So, um, so it's very important to know whether you're positive or negative for women, um, and if you don't know when you're pregnant, they're going to find out right among other things they'll test you for everything under the sun but the good news is if you're positive you don't ever have this to worry about if you're negative right it, it, there's always a potential for this happening one of these ways they'll help protect against this is there's a drug that they give called rogam and it's actually antibodies against the positive red blood cells of the baby so they'll give this to you so that you will eliminate them without making your own antibodies right um, these were antibodies made by someone else, right? They're going to bind to the positive red blood cells. We're going to eliminate them that way without getting an immunological response, hopefully. Um, once you produce antibodies, right, that, that really creates a problem. And if you want to find out about that, talk to Dr. LeBlanc because his wife is negative and they've had three kids. It's been fun. Negative um, been Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a great situation. So type three is immune complex mediated. And I used this term previously when we were doing our activity, right? This means antigen and antibodies. And in this case, soluble antigens. And these complexes sometimes don't get cleared, right? So they'll get deposited in different areas of the body and this would create some problems. So key into where these key places where they settle, where they deposit. And again, we're producing antibodies. So what's the process? You've got to be sensitized first, right? You've got to be exposed. You've got to produce the antibodies, right? And you have those antigen antibody complexes that happen upon the second exposure, okay? So these reactions are upon second exposure. Immune complexes consist of antigens and antibodies bound together. Although large immune complexes are engulfed by phagocytes and removed, intermediate-sized immune complexes are not readily removed. 
These intermediate complexes react with and activate complement. For example, complement activation in blood vessels causes basophils to degranulate, which causes vasodilation. Immune complexes in trapped in blood vessels or other tissues, such as kidney glomeruli, activate complement, which attracts neutrophils and causes them to degranulate. Neutrophils release enzymes responsible for tissue damage. So these could happen in our blood vessels, right? They tend to deposit in the skin, joints, and the kidneys. This can be very damaging, right? And those small blood vessels that are meant to filter our blood. And then it can happen system-wide, right? You can end up with disseminated intravascular coagulation, like they're showing there, right, where it's actually happening in the small blood vessels, right? And you can actually even get destruction of those small blood vessels. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is serum sickness, and I think I didn't give you guys that handout, did I? Um, so I posted it on Blackboard, and I have some handouts left, and I'm going to ask that people that don't like to read on the computer, right, or don't have readily access to um, print out, printing out things to, to grab the handouts, and, and then, because um, I'm not sure if I have enough for everybody. So... Um, about what I wanted to do right now. Serum sickness. Serum sickness. 